Welcome to BrainFluence. I'm Roger Dooley. Today, my friend Michael Port returns to the show. Michael has a golden touch. He left a successful acting career for a new career in business. After rising quickly on the business development side of the fitness industry, he became a consultant helping other industries develop business. His first book, Book Yourself Solid, has sold hundreds of thousands of copies now. And somewhere along the way, he diversified into the speaking and communications coaching space with his heroic public speaking business. In a past episode, Michael was there to discuss his book, Steal the Show, which I highly recommend. And a lot has changed since then, though. And so I decided it was time to get Michael back on the show and let him steal my show. Welcome back, Michael. Thank you so much. Yeah, so, uh, you know, your business in these COVID times must have changed pretty dramatically. How, How have things changed for you? Well, sure. Uh, You know, for those who are watching on video, you can see behind me, uh, we're at Heroic Public Speaking HQ. And uh, we... Those look like uh, empty seats back there. (laughs) Those are very empty (laughs) seats. Uh, Very, very safe. Uh, There's nobody else here at the moment. Uh, But, you know, prior to COVID, uh, you know, we would have events uh, every single week here that were full uh, with waiting lists, uh, you know, months in advance. And of course, uh, you know, we could bring in a few people and have, you know, very uh, awkward, socially distant events uh, where people feel anxious uh, because they don't know who's safe and who isn't. Uh, but that doesn't, uh, it doesn't gel with our philosophy of creating a safe environment for the people that we serve. Uh, so, uh, so we've decided to hold off on doing any in-person events Uh, until we know that people will feel safe and comfortable. And in the meantime, we're doing a lot of uh, virtual events, live stream events. We've put our programming online. And, you know, we we did a lot of hybrid programming in the past. Uh, You know, really, I I started in this industry in 2003 and have been running uh, virtual programming uh, for decades. So it wasn't new to us. We were fortunate that the pivot was really quite uh, smooth, quick for us. Uh, we didn't have to get up to speed on how to run virtual events or how to, uh, you know, film, uh, you know, classes uh, and uh, and learn the methodology behind online programming. Uh, we were already pretty uh, well versed in that. But, you know, it's it's not our first choice, frankly. We like being in the room with people. Uh, it's probably not our second or even third choice, uh, but it's definitely a lot better than, you know, being in an environment that isn't safe. Yeah, there's really something to be said for meeting in person. And uh, I have to acknowledge, Michael, that uh, you and our mutual friend, Mike McCallowitz, were instrumental in the birth of my book, Friction. At least uh, maybe not so much the birth um, it had been conceived already, but in perhaps uh, helping the uh, labor and delivery along partway through because uh, we all met at an author's retreat that you and Mike hosted. And just the ability to be in person with uh, both you and Mike as experts uh, and authors and other both authors and budding authors uh, really creates a different sense of focus than if you were you know tuning into a webinar or something uh, to accomplish the same task. But yeah. I mean, these are the days we live in. You know, Michael, a lot of your clients are professional speakers. Uh, you know, what changes are you seeing in that industry? I mean, I, I know I'm seeing uh, some some pretty big changes. What, what's well, your perspective this- on that? Yeah, and the professional speaking uh, industry has changed dramatically, of course, because in-person events, uh, for the most part, are on hold. And so it's really just a simple question of supply and demand. Uh, Right now, uh, there are certainly lots of organizations uh, doing virtual events, virtual programming, and there are lots of really skilled speakers delivering high-quality virtual programming. But because... Uh, the industry operates on a supply and demand sort of econ 101 uh, framework like most industries. Uh, There is a lot of supply and not a lot of demand, uh, even for people at the top of their game, because it's a lot easier to deliver a virtual program uh, because it doesn't take as much time. So certainly the industry thinks, well, we don't need to pay what we needed to pay before. And because there's so much uh, more supply, they're going to be able to, you know, pay less. Uh, So most speakers uh, are charging maybe 30% of what they were charging for in-person events. 
Now, if they have a lot of demand, hopefully they can do more of them to make up for that difference. But, you know, let's say a speaker who, you know, let's say a speaker works 50 times a year, meaning speaks 50 times a year, which is a, a pretty full plate for a professional speaker. Some do more, certainly, but 50 to 55 gigs is a, is a pretty full plate. Uh, you know, it would take them a day to travel there, then they're there for the gig, then the next day they travel home. So maybe they could get in two gigs a week, but that's it. Uh, now, right, don't, sure, don't even you talk could about do, international gigs because uh, yeah, they're of course international gigs. You may be a whole week. You know, you're out of pocket for that one gig. So yeah, sure, you could do a gig every single day of the week now, virtually, or two a day. But the amount of demand that you'd have to have would be so high uh, that it's just uh, it's not likely unless maybe you're Simon Sinek or Brene Brown uh, or uh, at that. Uh, level of fame mm -hmm. in the industry. So it's just uh, an unfortunate uh, consequence of, of the pandemic. But again, once we're, once events come back, and I think that will not really happen in any significant way until there is a vaccine that people are comfortable with, uh, you know, the supply and demand will change because there will be again more demand and a, a lower supply of speakers. So the fees will go back up. Um, but I'm, you know, we spend a lot of our time, uh, you know, <laughs> worrying about the, our speakers uh, and, uh, and trying to find ways to support them. Uh, but it's definitely a difficult time for most people in the industry. There's no doubt about it. Right. And to be fair to the conference organizers, they're under tremendous pressure, too, because oh, yeah. uh, now some previously paid events are going free because yeah. people aren't going to pay what they would have paid for an in-person event. Uh, you know, and there's yeah, so much free content on the web, you know, yeah. many people are not going to pay unless it's truly exceptional content. They're not going to pay $500 or $1,000 for, you know, two days of speeches, uh, yeah. virtual speeches. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, in the same right. way, people are rebelling at uh, paying uh, fifty or $60,000 for a college education via Zoom. You know, it's like, yes. okay, yeah. we're, we're, we're not quite getting the same experience. Yeah, so, you know, and, as so a that, father that, of... That of three down. kids, uh, you know, who will be attend, who will be going to college in a couple of years. Uh, I really resonate with that uh, concern. Um, you know, even here at Heroic Public Speaking, you know, we're doing uh, multi-day live stream programming that uh, we're offering for free uh, because it just makes the uh, the initiation process so much easier. Uh, if we can give people an opportunity to experience what our virtual programming is like, uh, then, you know, uh, a significant portion of them will raise their hand and say, I'd like to do more comprehensive uh, virtual training with you. But I think they need to experience the quality first without a higher barrier for entry, meaning without having to put down uh, significant amounts of money, uh, because most of what they're seeing out in the world uh, is not particularly compelling, uh, and uh, and how you know how does anyone know, you know if 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 a, if an event is actually going to be effective, uh, when what they're seeing uh, typically is not particularly compelling. So we just said we're going to take the price point uh, out of the equation, make it free, uh, and uh, and do those you know multi-day live streams. So that people can say, wow, that's not only the best live stream event I've ever been to, but that might be one of the be best events that I've ever been to uh, in person or virtual. So that's our goal when we're doing those events. But we, we, we decided right off the bat, just make them free, make them easy. Mm -hmm. Right. And I know you've got an upcoming event here just a few days after this podcast first airs. And we'll, we'll get uh, to that at, uh, near the end, and we'll provide links both uh, here on the show and also we'll put them on the show notes page uh, so people can access uh, all of the free content. Uh, and speaking of free content, one thing that I did find on your website, Michael, was a free uh, download, a relatively short PDF of Guide to Presenting in a Virtual Mode. Uh, some really good insights in there. And one of the things that you talk about uh, is energy, community energy, uh, where most speakers tend to uh, feed off the energy from an audience, depending on you know, what kind of speaker they are. Uh, they can gauge whether they're losing the audience or whether the audience is keeping up with them. Uh, you know, and they can uh, actually draw some inspiration if the audience is really responding. You know, when you're simply talking into a microphone and a camera, 
uh, that's it's not so easy. So how uh, you know how do you suggest dealing with that? Well, this is a major issue that uh, anybody who gives speeches contends with, uh, even when the speech is in person, because very often you'll hear a speaker say, "Oh, well, you know, it didn't go that well. The audience wasn't great. <laughs> you know, they didn't give me much." Well. Uh, Chances are, if, if the audience wasn't great, uh, they're probably assigning the blame to the wrong, <laughs> wrong Ex- person there. <laughs> yes, exactly. Because, you know, I really do hate to break it to the speaker, uh, but uh, it's never the audience's fault. If a speech doesn't work, it's never the audience's fault. If, if the speech you're delivering to a particular audience is not relevant for them, that's the speaker's problem. Or it's the meeting planner's problem that they booked the wrong speaker. Uh, but if you can't engage the audience, uh, it really is ineffective to blame them. The same thing uh, as an author. If you're writing a book and people don't respond to the book, you can say, well, they don't know what they're, the readers are idiots. I mean, if they were smarter, they'd understand it. Well, that's not, uh, that's not a particularly productive way of thinking about our work uh, in service of our audiences. Yeah, so, yeah. F- f- oddly enough, Michael, just about a week or two ago uh, on a different podcast, uh, I used pretty much the same line for those uh, web designers and app designers uh, where the customers are unable to figure out what to do. Like, they're clicking the stuff that's not clickable. Uh, they, they, they're not finding the buy now button. And the designers are just going on about how stupid people are, uh, that yeah. they can't see what's obvious in front of them, that they're, you know, they're clueless. Yeah. Well, my, Again, favorite, you know, my you're, favorite you're pointing the finger in the wrong direction. Exactly. My favorite book on uh, user experience uh, is the book uh, "Don't Make Me Think." Yeah, Steve Krug. Yeah, it's it's awesome. One I constantly recommend. And it, it's the great thing about that book, Michael, is that uh, even if you don't read or buy the book, although I do recommend that people do that, it's out in a, at least a second edition now, if not. A oh, I think edition. it's it's probably uh, it's got a number more editions than that. Right. Yeah. I mean, no, it's I, it's been so it's been reprinted and updated. But uh, if even if you don't buy it, if you just think about the title and yeah. internalize that as your basic operating system when you're designing stuff, uh, you know, that's almost good enough. You know, it's, yeah. it's like, just, just do it. You know, I mean, he's got great amusing examples in there, but uh, you know, it just internalize the title of the book and you're going to be way ahead of the game. Yeah. Now when serving audiences uh, either in person or virtually, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily follow that approach entirely. Meaning when you're, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about marketing and you, know, you want people to take a particular action on a website, well, you, 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 you don't wanna make them work too hard. You don't wanna make them have to think. You wanna be able to lay out the process so that they follow it really quite easily. When you're giving speeches, presentations of any kind, whether you're a professional or an entrepreneur or someone who is uh, just advancing a cause or a mission of some kind. If you take that don't make them think approach, then sometimes uh, they sit back and it just washes over them uh, and they don't engage. So Andrew Stanton is one of the, uh, one of the principals at Pixar uh, explained the way that they think about a perfect film. And he said it's an equation. And he said it's, uh, the, uh, the goal is uh, a perfect film is a four. Let's just say a perfect film is a four. Our job is to give the audience two. And then their job is to give us two. And if, and if we meet there in the middle, then we've got a great film. But if we give them zero or one, they, they're often a little confused. Like, I'm not sure what, to, they have to work too hard to keep up. But if they give them three or four, then they just sit back, shovel popcorn in their face, and don't actually engage intellectually or emotionally with the film. So when we're doing uh, any kind of presentation, uh, we can use that concept uh, in a way that's similar. Because we want to challenge often the status quo, And if we're challenging the status quo, it's going to require that we actually make people think. But if we challenge the status quo in such a way that it's too much work to consume and process, then they'll they'll turn out, they'll tune out or turn off. 
And so we've just got to be careful about that. So the way that we like to think about communication in any medium, one-on-one -on -one with a person in a room uh, or a large audience in a room or one-on-one -on -one virtually or with a large audience virtually is to first make sure we're 100% clear on what our objective is. Because if we know what our objective is, then we can choose tactics that will hopefully achieve that objective. So if we don't have an objective in mind, then we're just either just sharing information randomly, which is not particularly helpful, uh, or the whole thing is just messy. But once we know what our objective is, then we start to look at our tactics. And the first tactic we want to consider is safety. How do we make sure that the people we are serving feel safe? Because if we want to change what people do, we need to change how they think. And if we want to change how they think, we need to change how they feel. And if we don't focus on safety first, then we may not be intentionable, intentional about how they feel. If we can focus first on how they feel, then on how they think, and then on what they do, we can move progressively through that process to get them to take different actions. And safety is such an incredibly important part of any negotiation process, any pitch process, any engagement with other human beings where you're trying to change the outcome or get them to think or do something different. And so safety first is always paramount. For example, let's say you were having an issue with your teenage daughter. Uh, she starts dating this guy who you feel is I had one, one of those or two, once, Michael. You had one of those ones? I, I had he one of those like, ones, yes. Yeah, uh, teenage daughters. Yes, uh, yes, she's uh, still, still around, but no longer a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. It, it goes quite quickly, fortunately, because those years can be a little rough sometimes. But let's say she starts dating a guy who's maybe one or two bad decisions away from reform school or worse. And you're just not happy about this. You're not happy about it because she's not playing the piano anymore, which is one of her great loves. She's not hanging out with the friend group that, uh, that she's had for a long, long time and that you feel are really, really solid human beings and contribute positively to her life. She's not spending as much time with, the, with your family, which you feel is a really positive influence, and she's always loved doing so. So there's all sorts of changes that are taking place as a result. Now, if you go to her and say, hey, listen, what, what, what's your daughter's name? Alicia. Alicia. You say, listen, Alicia, the guy's a bum. I think he's, you know, going really, really, you know, uh, uh, he's got no future. He's going in the wrong direction. You have, uh, you're not hanging out with him. That's it. Done. End of story. How well do you think that's going to go? Probably not probably, very well. Probably not very well. Why? Because yeah, we haven't had that exact discussion, but uh, generally those kinds of um, uh, approaches never work. They don't work because or, she feels boy. because she feels that you are taking something from her. And as a result, she feels unsafe. Something she wants is being taken from her. She's being constrained. And as a result, she feels unsafe. But if you can go into that conversation and say, listen, obviously, I'm a little concerned about this guy. You know, you know, you know who I am and, you know, and what I want for you. So it, it's not a, you know, I, I, you get that, right? And she'll say, yeah, I, I do. I get it. Okay. She says, listen, my goal is not to take him away from you. I, I do not have any intention of, of controlling you or limiting you in any way, shape, or form. My only intention is to, is to support you in staying engaged with the things that I know are important to you and that you've always loved doing, like playing the piano and spending time with your close friends and your family, et cetera. Um, I don't want to take anything away from you. And then all of a sudden she says, oh, well, okay. All right, I'm willing to have this conversation now. You made her feel safe that you weren't going to take something from her. And as a result, you might be able to get her staying engaged with her friends with the family and with her other activities, which 
is safer for you and your goals for her, even if she stays uh, dating this guy who you're not crazy about because you know she doesn't lose all of the other things that are foundational in her life. So this is just one example, but you can extrapolate this example out to uh, a thousand different situations uh, when you're trying to you know, change somebody's behavior or change how somebody thinks about something. So we like to start with safety. And uh, you know, if it's in the room, start with safety. If it's online, start with safety. And one of the ways that you can start with safety is by demonstrating that you understand the way the world looks to the people in the room, to the people that you're talking to. So in the case of the daughter, you know, you may say, I, I really understand this guy has opened up social circles to you. Uh, he seems really fun. Uh, he's exciting. Uh, and it probably feels really good, you know, to be with him. Uh, and, and, and she starts to go, yeah, that, that's right. You get me. You understand me. Because very often when we're trying to change the way somebody feels, thinks, or acts, it can be quite provocative. You know, let's say you've got uh, a boardroom of uh, executives who have been, uh, have been working in a particular way for decades. You know, they've been running this board in the same way for a long, long time, but you're trying to change uh, the way that they operate. Well, if you just go and say, listen, what's happening now doesn't work. Doesn't work. May have worked in the past, doesn't work now. We're changing everything. Well that's gonna make people really, really nervous because they don't know if they can operate in another way, even if they were open to it. If you've been behaving in a particular way for decades, uh, you may feel pretty comfortable with that way of being, but if all of a sudden you've gotta try a totally different way of being, it may be very scary for you. Now you may act tough about it, but uh, you know, underneath all that toughness, most people are, are, are scared of change. You know, there's an expression, the only, person that likes a change is a baby with a wet diaper. <laughs> Most adults, once they get set in their ways, they're not comfortable with it, even if they're open to it. So if we can first focus on safety, then we often have the ability to come in with bigger ideas, with, with philosophies, or ways of being that may be more impactful. And people might say, okay, I'll, I'll pay attention, I'll listen, because it's very provocative to ask people to change the way they've been behaving or thinking for a long, long time. You know, it's why, of course, we've got such, you know, uh, turmoil in our political world, uh, because, you know, if somebody, if, if somebody voted in a particular way four years ago, uh, and, and now you tell them that they're an absolute idiot for having done that. Uh, do you think that's going to encourage them to change the way they uh, are, are voting? Probably not, because you, you usually, you know, dig in and, in, and entrench your positions uh, when other people challenge them uh, very, very aggressively. So you know, one, one thing first. this pandemic has done, Michael, is really accelerated change in a lot of industries where you had a lot of that... Uh, uh, sort of reactants going on where people did, uh, you know, yeah, we're, we're going to have to do that someday, but that's not job one or yeah, it probably won't work suddenly. Wow. You know, we've got to do that today. So, yeah. Um, you know, one, uh, speaking about safety, I'm going to interject something here uh, for our audio listeners. Uh, they can't see you, Michael, but uh, uh, you are seated and there's a table and people can see your hands. Just a couple of weeks ago, I had Vanessa Van Edwards on and, she also talked about safety uh, in presenting and persuading. And one of uh, her maxims was let people see your hands because there is an, um, a bias toward that. It shows that you, at least going back to our earlier days, uh, that you don't have some kind of a weapon in your hand. Uh, and also an open posture shows uh, that you aren't uh, being threatening, that you're exposing yourself to the other person, which is um, uh, a friendly gesture, uh, smiling and so on. But uh, uh, it's kind of a unique setup that you've got for your video conference here. I think it's, it's effective because also uh, you can uh, use your hands to emphasize what you're saying, where it's all too often we see sort of a glowing face in front of a screen, uh, you know, from somebody's uh, basement or family room or something. So uh, that's uh, that's good. I like that. And for our audio listeners, I encourage them to tune into uh, the video 
on YouTube, and they can get it from the show notes page as well. Well, it is true. You know, I mean, there's when you see the palm right now. For those who are listening, I'm holding up my hands. Uh, my my whole uh, I can stretch out my hands all the way, almost all the way straight, uh, and you can still pretty much see them. So that's how wide the frame is uh, on my camera. And I just look down now to look at the computer screen. But if, for those who are watching uh, on video, you probably notice that it looks like I'm looking directly at you because I've been looking into the lens of the camera rather than down at the screen, which would you know have you just looking at my brow and you wouldn't actually really see my eyes. It would be a little strange. Now, certainly, you know, the camera can be moved up uh, but um, but I don't actually need to because what I do while I'm listening to you is I react as if I'm seeing you. Mm-hmm. But I'm only hearing you. I'm not actually seeing you as uh, as we're speaking. I just hear you. And the fact of the matter is, especially uh, when you have video communication, there's often a lag, even if it's a, a, a very, very short lag that you can't, perceive, I mean, sometimes the lag is very long and you're waiting and you're going, I'm, I, I know they're going to say, what, saying something, did they, okay, oh, there they are, right, okay, good. But, uh, but even when uh, the audio is in sync, there is still a little bit of a lag, and so you're not able to pick up micro expressions uh, in the way that you can if you're actually sitting across the table from somebody. Uh, this is one of the issues uh, that you know, people don't realize exists in this video communication. As good as, that, as good as it is, it still takes thousands and thousands of, of coding processes to get the video across uh, the country or the world. And so uh, I know you had our friend Nick Morgan on the show, and I'm sure he discussed this. Uh, this is one of his areas of specialty. Uh, but we're actually better at picking up emotion in the sound of someone's voice uh, than we are at picking up emotion through the video screen uh, during these web conferences. Uh, And so uh, sometimes it's actually quite a good idea to turn off the camera and just listen uh, rather than watch. Uh, And that's why uh, I don't actually worry about watching you during this. I can still stay looking right at the camera with very, very focused uh, attention uh, on uh, on whoever is watching, so they're seeing my eyes fully, but I'm listening to you and allowing myself to have an emotional response to you so you can see that on my face as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've pretty much trained myself to look at the camera too, but I mean, I've, I know that I've in the past have been guilty of looking down at the person talking because that's natural. You know, in a conversation, you look at the other person's face. So, you know, yeah. and it's just such a natural thing to do, but you see the effect when you're on a, a Zoom call where everybody's kind of looking, focused yeah. down, looking and down and... Yeah. And not, you know, I, I, just want to, I just want to say something for, uh, for everybody who is watching and listening right now. Uh, if you don't enjoy staring into a tiny little webcam uh, like we're doing right now, uh, and you would rather actually engage with people face to face. Good for you. <laughs> there, there's, there's, you know, you, you probably have a lot of communication, uh, you know, uh, experts, quote unquote, uh, who will try to make it sound like this world of virtual communication is a, a panacea of uh, of connection and. Uh, and an idealism, and it's just not for me personally. I'm only speaking for myself. So if you feel that it's less than ideal, and that you don't love it either, and that you're fatigued after sitting in front of the, you know, the camera for hours and hours, that is perfectly normal, perfectly reasonable. And it's why I'm so excited for the events to come back, because I think people are going to clamor for them. They're going to want to be uh, in the room. Yes, things will, there'll be some things about the virtual communication that will stay. Yes, we may not, you know, go into the office quite as much as we did before, but people want to engage with each other. We are human beings who are social uh, and we're going to, we're going to want that. So those events are going to come back uh, and I'm excited for it. And if you don't love uh, the virtual presentation world, that's perfectly fine. I don't think you are obligated to, because it's actually not innately human. You know, well, you know, while we're on that topic, one of the maxims I've heard lately from conference people and such is that 
Um, in a virtual world, you want your presentations to be shorter because people's attention span, their ability to sit in place and watch a speaker uh, is shorter. So, you know, instead of a 40 minute keynote, maybe you'll do a 20 or 25 minute keynote. Do you think this is true? Or again, is this ref uh, more reflection of the quality of the speaker, the content, the delivery and so on? Yeah, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say, I think it's more a reflection of the quality of the presentations. You know, there's a, probably a number of different factors that influence. Certainly, if you are on Zoom all day long, you've got so much fatigue that, uh, that you're inclined to say that you want shorter experiences. Uh, but um, are, are you, uh, do you know uh, Andrew Davis? Yes, vaguely, not, not particularly so, well, but so we're, Andrew we're Davis is a, Facebook, I think. Okay, great. So uh, I think you and Andrew should meet and, and maybe he'd be a great guest for your show. Uh, he's a marketing expert. He's a great been uh, episode number 197. I've forgotten completely too. So. It could be, um, but uh, he's a, he's a great friend of mine and we're writing a book together called the referable speaker. And uh, you know, the, the question that we answer in the book is what makes a speaker referable so that they uh, get gig after gig after gig after gig uh, because people see their speeches and tell other people that they have to see the speech. So we've been working on this book for quite some time. And, uh, and, and one of the things, the reason I mentioned Andrew now is because uh, he has a bit in one of the speeches that he gives, and I worked on this speech with him, uh, that, that really digs into this concept. Because, you know, the question that he poses is, well, look, if, if, if and, and this is not just around virtual presentations, but marketers have been saying this for a number of years, which is audiences want snackable content, you know, short little bites. They don't want long form content. He says, well, if that's, if that's actually true, right, that everything should be snackable and bite-sized, why does somebody binge watch Stranger Things in a weekend? You know, we will, we'll sit down and we'll watch 12 hours of, of film programming or TV programming over a short period of time. Why? Because it's really it's gosh engaging. darn good. You can't turn it off. It's so good. And so I think focus less on the length and more on the quality. And so it's the same thing. It's been, it's, it's been the same way with sales letters, you know, for decades, uh, you know, video um, uh, sales pitches, uh, speeches, you know, in, in, the, in the room, uh, virtual presentations. If we're first focusing on, well, how long should it be before we've actually conceived of the material and worked on a script uh, and rehearsed it and, and tweaked it, how on earth do we know how long it's supposed to be? Mm -hmm. so, so for example, uh, this two day live stream event that we've got coming up, there is not one session that is the same length as any other session. It's a two day event and we run it from noon Eastern to I think around six o'clock Eastern each day. And we have, uh, oh gosh, there must be, Close, probably 16 different sessions over those two days, and they're all different lengths. Why? Because they don't need to be the same length. They are as long as they need to be to teach that particular concept. And so instead of thinking about how long it should be, first focus on, well, what, what's my objective? How am I going to deliver it? I don't need any more time than it takes to deliver on this objective or on this promise. And I'm gonna take as much time as is necessary to deliver on this objective and this promise. Because if it's really, really compelling, people would stay for hours. You know, like we'd get feedback from people say, look, I, I was just gonna pop in for an hour, but after the first hour, it was, I was realized it was so good, I canceled everything for the next two days and I watched every single minute of it. Or people say, I, I stayed up, I'm, on, I'm in China and I watched it from China. So it's two o'clock in the morning for me and I'm not going to bed. This is too good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that's one advantage that virtual events have over in-person events, because if you're a conference organizer, uh, you've got a pretty rigid schedule template to follow. You've got so much space and time for the keynote, uh, for the panel discussions, for the breakouts. Uh, you've got lunches and breakfast and everything else in there. And you can't really have a speaker say, well, you know, instead of 
25 minutes. I could really use 37. You know, it's like, <laughs> find something. Well, that's yes. Good. I mean, yes, I know. It really, I, I'd say yes. I think that meeting planners are in a particularly difficult situation because if they're hiring experienced speakers, those experienced speakers can certainly adjust the length of uh, their speech to fit the length of time allotted. Right. But if the meeting planner is not working with that speaker on the speech, which they don't, and they really, you know, probably shouldn't be, um, it, they would be sort of randomly uh, just saying, well, I'll give you 37 minutes. And then the speaker has to figure out how to fit to 37 minutes, which is not uh, what we're suggesting is, is effective right. here. Uh, but when you're putting on your own conferences, and when, say, we put on conferences, whether they're in person or virtual, uh, it's same thing applies. We'll have sessions that will end, you know, 22 minutes after the hour. And then we just make the break, you know, uh, such that it comes back on an easy, we don't we'll come back from the break at, you know, 9.52. We come back from the, from the break at 10 o'clock. You make it easy when you come back from those breaks. Uh, but because we're in control of all the programming uh, and, and the people that are speaking uh, are, our people are our, our, our faculty, you know, we're going to be able to do that. So it is a little bit harder for meeting planners uh, to do that. But I think speakers think that they have to fill every single second of the time allotted. So for example, let's say you're given 60 minutes, but you actually don't need 60 minutes. You don't pad in extra material just to fill the time. Nobody ever got fired for delivering a 10 out of 10 presentation five minutes in five minutes less time than was allotted. Nobody, nobody ever got fired because they said, well, listen, we paid for 60. You only did 55. I mean, I know everybody said it was a 10 out of 10 best thing they've ever seen, but we're very unhappy. It never happens like that. What happens is when you deliver a mediocre presentation that runs over time, then you, you don't get hired back again. So uh, it's, and look, audiences, uh, because they're so busy and there's often so much packed into an event, either virtual or in person, they love a little extra free time. So if you end a little bit early and say, listen, I got a gift for you. I got a little uh, extra seven minutes here for you. You know, go enjoy. Their break just got longer. Now, of course, you have to coordinate these things with a meeting planner because if, this, if the team is not aware that you're going to end seven minutes early, then it can be a scramble because the coffee isn't ready. Uh, or, you know, they're, they're kind of hanging out uh, and all of a sudden, boom, the doors open and people flood out of the room, uh, then, of course, that becomes problematic for them. But Not Another good uh, reason to rehearse because that way you'll know exactly how long it's going to take. And, yeah. uh, you know, I've uh, seen even experienced speakers uh, screw up the whole full day conference schedule because uh, they were the first one out of the gate and ran an extra 20 minutes or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I've, it's, it's I've, been, I've, I've been on, uh, I've been speaking at events where they had to cut a speaker because multiple speakers went over. <laughs> yeah, and that's, uh, that's really brutal, especially for the person who got cut the, for the reputation yeah. of the conference. That speaker is never going to come back to that conference ever. So yeah, yeah I mean, go on, uh, they'll, probably, they, they'll probably be given the keynote for next year, but they'll get to go first. Yeah, maybe. Is, or that, that would have to be the promise anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then they could take their revenge on the organizer by going over by yeah. 30 minutes. But anyway, uh, why don't you tell everybody, Michael, where people can find out about the virtual event that you're having, as well as uh, other information like the free download that I grabbed for sure. presenting virtual. I'd love to. And then I would, and, and then else. if I may, I'd love, I'd also sure. love to just introduce one more concept that I think is important, especially for, for those uh, of your listeners who are entrepreneurs or uh, in, the, in the business space. They're not professional speakers necessarily. Yeah, you, know, uh, you know, I said this was going to be steal my show, but not grand larceny, but, but go, go ahead, Michael. That's okay. <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of this two-day event that we mentioned, uh, if you go to heroicpublicspeaking.com forward slash stream, S-T-R-E-A-M, heroicpublicspeaking.com forward slash stream, uh, you can see that it's uh, free to register there. Uh, and you can come watch as much or as little of those two days as you would like. Although, if you do watch it, you're going to want to stay. So uh, open up your calendar. Now, and at HeroicPublicSpeaking.com, there is a download that is a primer on how to be very effective in virtual presentations. So you can see that at HeroicPublicSpeaking.com. And if you've got a question for me, just uh, shoot me an email at questions at HeroicPublicSpeaking.com. Now, 
One thing that I think is really important for folks who give presentations to consider is how they want to be seen. Because very often, entrepreneurs, business professionals, they go into speaking thinking of themselves as an expert. And I think there was a time when that made sense. And certainly, if you are a service professional of any kind and you want to be hired, it's very important to be seen as an expert, especially if you do work for people. If you're in marketing, uh, and you and you have a consulting firm, and you want people to hire your firm to do the marketing, you better have a whole bunch of experts in best practices at that firm, for sure. But if you want to be a speaker, or even an, an author that is in high demand, in that they're given the key spots at a virtual or in-person event, rather than being relegated to the breakout rooms, you want to consider thinking of yourself and the work that you do, the content that you bring as visionary content rather than expert content. And there's an important distinction between those two uh, schools of thought. Experts bring best practices. And there's nothing wrong with being an expert. But experts bring best practices. And especially over the last decade with the rise of YouTube and the, the broader internet, expertise has become commoditized. There are hundreds, if not thousands of other people who can deliver the best practices in your industry. And those people are often given speaking spots, but they are usually given breakout spots. And they're generally not paid very well. They're giving how-to advice. But if you look at a conference agenda and you study the agenda, you'll notice that the people who are given the keynote spots, the people whose pictures are much bigger and bios are more prominently featured and get the best time slots with the general audiences, those are the people who are delivering visionary content. Visionary content that challenges the status quo and often offers new ways of thinking. And so you can move from that expert space into that visionary space with, with small tweaks. You don't even need massive uh, changes very often. Sometimes it's just in the way that you position yourself and the content that you're teaching. Uh, because again, best practices, you know, I can learn best practices for uh, homepage usability uh, by spending a few days, uh, if not a few hours, uh, studying a few books uh, online, no problem. Uh, but if you do wanna be featured more prominently, if you do wanna be seen as somebody who is a thought leader or, uh, an industry change agent, then think about being a visionary in terms of the kind of content that you're bringing to the people that you serve. And one of the ways of doing that is by being able to ask and answer questions that Google cannot. This is something that Andrew and I are focusing on uh, in the referable speaker, which will be out next year. Because if if the questions that you're answering in a presentation that you give are questions that the audience can find out by searching Google, you're a commodity. But if you're raising bigger questions, like for example, at Heroic Public Speaking, you know, we're asking speakers to stop speaking and start performing. How do you become a better performer as a human being in a way that's authentic and effective that's not a question that Google can answer. We can. If you just want to learn tips for, you know, uh, how to make sure that you, you know, keep eye contact and, you know, have a well-structured speech, those are all pretty sort of basic best practices. But the visionary content is what really creates your name in an industry 
uh, so that you carve out a whole new space in that industry where you essentially become a category of one simply because you're challenging the status quo. You're bringing big new ideas that people who sit in the C-suite, et cetera, really, really need uh, because uh, they need uh, unconventional thinking to break out of the challenges or problems that they're having. They don't need more best practices. That's more for frontline folks. They need the big visionary thinking. So what question can you answer that Google cannot and how do you build your brand around that question? Great, well, that is really good advice. I'm glad we paused for that moment after uh, your info. I'll remind our listeners and viewers that we will link to the places that you mentioned for the various free content and other information on the show notes page at rogerdooley.com slash podcast. And we'll have the audio, video, and text versions of our conversation there too. Michael, thanks so much for being on the show. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me.